Hello, everyone. I'm Julie, a PhD candidate uh, in international communication at Macquarie University. I am looking at how Australian media represent uh, China's environmental image. Okay. Yeah. So, Thank you. Well, Ross, you're the China expert. The, the toughest media on the world on China on environmental issues is the Chinese media. Uh, the, the, this is a big. Uh, uh, the, the pollution of the city is a big issue in China. Uh, and uh, and as the Chinese get richer, like people everywhere, uh, they uh, uh, attach more importance to uh, environmental amenity, and uh, and they, the public interest is one of the things driving uh, uh, Chinese government policy on these issues. The reality is still pretty bleak, uh, and. Uh, the uh, Chinese press and the international pr press uh, presents that uh, bleak uh, reality. Probably uh, the, the international discussion hasn't caught up with uh, changes in policy in China, uh, but it will uh, take a while before uh, uh, the air in, uh, in, in Beijing and Shanghai is uh, as clean even as the air in Sydney. Mm. Anything to add? Well, it it, it's interesting, most of the change, as I see it in China, has been driven by air quality issues rather than saving carbon. But the incidental benefit is that it also saves carbon. And that's another reason why, and if you want to take it from the other perspective, saving carbon, you get a whole lot of other incidental benefits, uh, air quality being one of them. Uh, we haven't touched upon um, you know, forests and biodiversity and so forth, but you get benefits in that area as well. There's a par parallel, I think, in the... Um 1970s, when the LA smog forced the Californian uh, jurisdiction to impose regulations on the auto industry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and because California is is an economy the size of many developed countries, uh, that affected Detroit and and indeed the Japanese car companies that were then building their market in the United States, and then spread out to, uh, to affect the whole world. And so in, in some ways, it seems to me that, uh, uh, that you can get game changers on a fairly local level, which have a, a much more broad uh, and even global uh, uh, effect. But that's just me chucking my little bit in the question. Uh, my name is Bill Leventrasser. I'm associated with the University of the Third Age in Sydney. Uh, question here is that it seems to be implied in the discussion that uh, dealing satisfactorily with carbon emission is going to provide a long-term solution to climate change. I wonder if this means that the so-called Gaia theory, which suggests that we've already reached the tipping point, is too late for a long-term solution and, we can, and uh, the expectation we're going to do something are perhaps too much uh, for us to handle. Uh, th there's no doubt that uh, the, the mainstream science uh, tells us that uh, we've gone so far that there will be serious damage and Australia will be one of the most damaged countries. Uh, so uh, th that's taken as a given. But the difference between doing what we can now and just letting the... Uh, uh, the, the emissions grow without mitigation is uh, a very large difference. Uh, the, uh, what's happening in the industrialization of China uh, will add to the rich people in the world uh, a number of people that's uh, twice as large as all the people who are currently rich in the world. Uh, and the same can be said uh, of India. So just, uh, and uh, the science tells us, that the vast majority of the science, that the consequence of that would be truly horrific. So although we're too late to avoid all damage, and we may be too late to avoid some quite nasty damage, uh, we're not too late uh, to uh, uh, avoid uh, outcomes uh, which uh, w would be truly catastrophic. Well, it, has become, have... it has become an important part of the current negotiation, though, because the the cost of adaptation to change, particularly for the smaller developing countries across the world, is quite enormous. It's going to be a big cost for developed countries like us as well, but for those who can't afford it. Now, who's going to pay for that? It's expected 
uh, that will have to be paid for by the developed world, uh, does that therefore mean less money that's going to be put into mitigation? Uh, there's only so much to, to go around, and that is a major complexity in an agreement that's basically got to be determined by consensus, and that's 192 parties, all with different economic <coughs> interests. So um, um, I think it, you know, we have gone so far now that there is a big cost for adaptation that we didn't take into account at the time of the Kyoto negotiation, and that adds a new layer of complexity. And Gillian Triggs... Uh the mills of international law grind exceeding slow. That must be a contributory factor, which makes it, which will eventually add to the urgency further. Well, that's that's true, except that when you realise what a new world we're in, this law is being created at an extraordinary speed relative to the period before the Second World War, for example. I mean, the international community has created a huge body of law in trade, in human rights, in environment, um, in cultural property, all sorts of things. There's been a, been a mass of law created. Uh, what really matters, frankly, is political will. And, and, and law, obviously, ultimately reflects that political will. What's being generated is much greater political will to achieve, achieve a result. Um, to the gentleman, uh, the, the Bill's, uh, Bill's question about Gaia theory, I think... Your, your question is an interesting one because, and this is really what uh, Senator Fielding is playing into in my view, and that is a, a very real need for people to understand the facts. They don't like unpleasant facts and you've got enough people out there perhaps challenging mainstream science um, and so there's always going to be a media interest in that perspective. Um, I, I think also there's, that we've become a little too distracted by, um, by the science in a sense because I would have thought, that, as Senator Hill uh, Mr Hill was, was saying, uh, there are so many uh, advantages to simply cleaning up our environment, um, uh, whether it's management of forests or, or, or simply ending the, the, the despoilment of our own nest. And I think by obsessing too much about the accuracy of, of ice ages versus climate change and Gaia theories and so on is, is perhaps ultimately not all that helpful. What we're really trying to do is to look at a cleaner environment in which we can manage our resources and, and have a sustainable environment on Earth. Thank you. Next question. Um, my name is Darcy Baxter. I'm an international studies, um, development studies student at the University of New South Wales. Um, my question is to anyone who wishes to answer it, but... In response to a point that um, Gillian raised earlier, um, in the flaws, the fundamental flaws of climate change convention frameworks, in that developed countries who are now not um, experiencing the same growth in carbon emissions as um, the more the larger developing countries such as China and India, um, and I wonder whether, given the globalized nature of um, our economy, our world in general, um, there is room for further consideration of the added complexity that um, perhaps emissions that are created in a set country are not always created for the benefit of that country only. We have offshore production and whether that brings another element um, into the debate that um, requires consideration. To some extent this goes to Australia's position as a massive exporter of coal. I'm going to change the pattern around and start with you, Robert Hill. <laughs> um, well, I, we want China to grow wealthy um, because it also is a great uh, consumer of our commodities. We want them to grow wealthy because it's better for China, but it's also better, it's better for us. It's part of, um, of globalisation. Um, but... Um, I was just thinking about the flaw. See, I've argued for years that this fundamental flaw in the convention, but if, if it didn't have the fundamental flaw, so you, you did, it didn't divide the world between the developed and the developing, <coughs> then you wouldn't have got, had a Kyoto Protocol. Now, some people will say, well, so what? But the Kyoto Protocol has created an environment within which developed and developing world have started this process of looking for alternatives and, and encouraging greater efficiency. Uh, and, um, you know, in a country like Australia, even though under the previous administration they may not have 
ratified Kyoto, nevertheless implemented a whole range of domestic reforms that's actually enabled Australia to achieve its Kyoto target. It wouldn't have happened without a Kyoto negotiation. So um, I don't think that fundamental flaw is now really making the task any more difficult for the future than what it would have been otherwise. I think we've got to that point now that we no longer see that clear distinction between developing and developed, particularly but with the large developing countries, and we've got to wrestle with that issue. And we would, would have had to wrestle with that issue now, whether or not there was the flaw in the convention. Um, uh, somebody very much earlier in this discussion talked about the possible death of globalisation. Um, I, I think that uh, globalisation is, is obviously with us and, and is going to continue to become more complex. The interconnectedness of everything we do is now very obvious. Um, the question about sort of offshore activities uh, does raise, I think, the, the, this interconnected, interconnectedness. And I think we have to understand and go back to perhaps the uranium allocate question that, that you export one product, you receive others, you're connected into it. And if we're going to deal with the, um, the, the greenhouse gas emission elements of those products, we have to understand that we have a part in a, in a wide global context. So we can't view these problems exclusively as national problems. We have to understand them in that more complex way. And I think that's going to become greater as the, as the, as the years go on. Yes, there is no solution that doesn't get us... There's no attempt at a solution that doesn't get us into a quite a big mess uh, in the trade sphere uh, without similar carbon pricing in all major uh, countries. Uh, uh, if we uh, create a system in which there's a big incentive for carbon-intensive uh, industries to locate in countries which don't have carbon pricing, uh, then... Uh, uh, you, well, you'll get quite a big distortion in the international uh, trading system, but you'll also get uh, a very strong political resistance to change. So uh, I don't think we can duck the question of uh, moving towards uh, uh, um, uh, similar carbon pricing across uh, all major countries. I think we have to end the divide in the, on this issue between developed and developing. Uh, the uh, conventions... Uh, recognition of the difference between developed and developing countries can be recognised in other ways. Uh, the, the, the targets can be set with a different basis. Uh, if you like, they can be more generous targets for developing countries, but you need a target and trade in entitlements to give you uh, the similar carbon price. There can be a differential effort uh, in commitments on research, development and commercialisation of the new technologies. That makes a lot of sense. Developed countries are the the, the place where this is going to happen most effectively anyway, uh, but we can't uh, 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 live with a, uh, a, a continuing distinction between uh, the developed countries and at least the major uh, developing countries. All right, we've probably only got time for a couple more questions. Um, Caroline Law, I'm a student at the Sydney Law School. Um, Professor Triggs, I have a question um, about the clash between international trade law and international environmental law. Um, as Professor Garno said, uh, technology is going to be very important for climate change adaptation and mitigation, um, especially, well, especially in developing countries as well. Um, and I was wondering what, you th what your thoughts were on um, the way the TRIPS agreement might... Um, affect technology transfer into developing countries? And do you think there needs to be exceptions, as there was with uh, HIV drugs in the 1990s and into the um, early noughties? Well, that's, a, that's a very nice way of, of bringing up again this, problem, this issue of harmonisation, because every indication is that TRIPS is being now developed and amended and changed in order to take account of these problems that are emerging, particularly in relation to generic drugs. So I think uh, at the moment there are indications of real optimism that uh, the, the, the TRIPS members are willing to amend the provisions to meet global public needs for access to medicines. So I do feel quite optimistic about that. Well, that was very much a targeted question to you, unless Ross or Robert want to join in. We'll take the next question. Hi, I'm Matt Cross from the US Study Centre. Uh, the famous words of Rahm Emanuel in saying you never want a serious crisis to go to waste. Does this mean that we actually should use the global financial crisis as a way of uh, investing domestic uh, governments, investing in uh, things like green jobs, green infrastructure or even an ETS? 
or does it mean that we actually have to wait until after the global financial crisis, uh, which is probably a date that still is very unknown? Well, Ross, I think you've already said that the, the crisis is, in fact, an opportunity. Yes, uh, um, and uh, quite a number of governments uh, are taking advantage of that. Uh, the, the investment in new uh, low emissions uh, capacity is quite important in the Obama program. It's very important in the Chinese program. Uh, it's even in there, in ours. Um, uh, but as has also been said, I think, by Robert, uh, the, the crisis is a good... Well, coming out of the crisis, recovery from crisis and recovery policies are, provide good circumstances economically for uh, structural change, but uh, politically uh, it's a hard time. By the way, Mac, I, I'm very glad that you managed to find a quote from... Rahm Emanuel that didn't have a swear word in it. <laughs> My heart sank for a moment there. <laughs> Gillian or Robert. Okay, uh, next question. Hi, my name is Jessica Q. I'm a postgrad student at Sydney Law School. I'm also a practicing engineer, so this is all very interesting for me. Um, going back to the point on China, I'm aware they are the source of like pollutions. But also, they have made vast amount of um, efforts, like sustainable buildings. Australia has helped them design one of the most sustainable buildings for Olympics. Um, for example, the Water Cube. And our firm itself is involved in the Dontan Environmental Sustainable Village. But again, um, there's heaps of political incentive in that, but not enough change in terms of environmental sustainable has achieved. It's all very bigger media circus. Going back on the Gaia theory, um, James Lovelock has mentioned this year in his new publication, burning coals and burying the ground actually stores more carbon than actually carbon sequestration or anything we have at the moment. But people tend to forget the fundamentals and go further on what's more glamorous through the media. Like My question is, do you think we have been tempted by those media glamour and derive away from what's fundamentally achievable and agreeable? It's a really interesting question, isn't it? Because one of the things that could really work is just better home insulation, better architecture, better building, and that is so unglamorous that it hardly ever gets mentioned in the climate change debate. Well, uh, pink bats have been quite a big part of the Australian yeah. recovery program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah. if you'd like to expand on it. Yeah. Or... Uh, I, I think it's inevitable that uh, the public debate in Australia and everywhere else will, uh, uh, will, will, will have a bit of circus about it. Uh, that's just the way our society works and our polity uh, works. Uh, that need not distract us from getting uh, the fundamentals right, but, but you're quite right, we have to focus on the fundamentals, and above all, I think that uh, uh, that's about uh, getting an international agreement that, that uh, adds up to a solution uh, that ends up with uh, similar emissions pricing in all of the major countries, and uh, there's a major uh, increase in... Uh, uh, public expenditure on uh, research development and uh, uh, commercialisation of the new low emissions technologies. All right, well, we pretty much have to wrap up, so this is the last question. Okay. Um, um, I'm Stephen from Macquarie Uni. Uh, first of all, a very short comment. When we're talking about climate change, we may now mainly focus on like a new technology or trading scheme, but I believe what really matters is about changing people's living habits. The worst case scenario of climate change would be every Chinese, every single Chinese or every single Indian believes they should drive as much as every American or Australian do, does. That would be the worst case of climate change. And I think in this regard, I think most Western countries or developed countries need to take the lead or set up a role model urgently. And a very, also a very short question, probably to Professor Garnett. What's your expectation on Copenhagen Conference Will it be another lift service or something like Kyoto Protocol, which will never be put into effect, actually? Thank you. Yeah. I think, I think one thing is very different this time uh, from, uh, from the aftermath of Kyoto, where you're quite right, lots of things weren't put into effect. And the big difference is that uh, 
uh, of the three developed countries which are the biggest emitters in the world uh, per capita, uh, Australia, the United States and Canada, uh, and which the rest of the world sees as, as uh, having to get its act together if there's going to be a global solution, two of those, the United States and Australia, uh, uh, immediately set about undermining the, uh, not immediately, Australia's case uh, from 2001. Uh, uh, from the United States, in the United States, from the time of the uh, the Senate uh, vote, uh, said about undermining the agreement, having, uh, especially of course, the United States, but the United States and, and, and Australia playing in the international team rather than against it, uh, makes a huge difference. Well, it, but to be fair to the United States, um, post Kyoto, the. Kyoto settled the framework and then there was subsequent detail to be determined. And the European, they saw themselves basically as an economic competition with the Europeans. The Europeans had the inbuilt benefit of the bubble that the United States didn't have. And the United States actually, at the you know, dying days of the Clinton administration, took a formula to a subsequent meeting in The Hague, which would have enabled the US to come on board and late at night, early in the morning, the Europeans finally rejected it. So it's not, um, you know, I don't think there's much value in just pointing the finger in this. We're all in it together. Uh, I think in a lot of ways we have made progress. You know, you look at what's happening now, um, uh, the targets, the voluntary targets that are being set across Europe, the targets talked about in the United States, targets talked about in Australia, these, these are would have been hard to envisage a decade ago. And, you know, in the space of time, that's a very short, uh, short period. Uh, we now have alternative energies developed also in a much greater extent than was envisaged a decade ago. And we have, have now have a much greater public focus on the issues. Uh, how do you conserve energy? What opportunities are available? New architectural practices and so forth. Uh, I, think, um, I think we're making significant pro. pro progress. The problem, of course, is that the problem is still moving at a faster rate than the progress. Uh, but uh, I wouldn't underestimate what has been achieved in the last, the last decade, the changes of attitude, the consolidation of the science and so forth, and I think we'll make a lot of progress in the next decade. Uh, but we'll do it if we do our best to work together as a team on this in a globalised way, rather than try to you know, attribute blame. Final thoughts from Eugene Intrix. Well, I completely agree with, with, with everything Robert said, but one might remember at the, at the smaller level that this recent campaign that's been started, I think it's a million women for climate change. Um, I can see things like that part of this culture that is, that is dramatically changing the way in which we use resources generally. Um, and, I, and I feel personally very, um, very optimistic. I think the law does move slowly, but the law moves to catch up with the political will. And I, I think there's a sense at the moment... That, that collaboration and cooperation must be, must be uh, sought and, and, and achieved, even though I think Copenhagen will not produce a completed agreement, I think it will take us some steps forward. Thank you very much. Thank you all of you very much. Uh, time's running out here. Time is clearly running out on, on, this, on this issue overall. I'll leave you with a, an image uh, going back again to when I was the Brussels correspondent and that one of the first uh, big European Council meetings that I covered. And uh, there was a deadline for this discussion, and the deadline was midnight. And midnight came and midnight went, and the deadline had not been met. And I said to one of the other journalists, one of the British journalists, what's going on? And he said, well, they've just put back the clock. <laughs> and they had literally wound the clock back by an hour. And we sat there until, until four o'clock in the morning and they just kept on winding back the clock. I think that might be a bit of an image for some of what's happening here today. But uh, Ross Garno, Gillian Triggs, Robert Hill, thank you very much indeed.